Al Jazeera Podcasts. I'm here subbing, you know, Parisian high fashion model. Como no te voy a querer? Como no te voy a querer? I'm an Arsenal fan. Did she call you Henri um, Thierry? Yeah. I mean, I could call you Karen too if you're feeling left out there, Jamie. Anisha Jones is charming, engaging, intelligent. She exudes charisma every time she steps on the stage. And in the world of football broadcasting, whether it's Champions League nights or under English Premier League lights, there's no room for off days. But what many people don't realize is that while she's interviewing some of the world's top footballers, she's in a lot of physical pain. Anita has a condition many women suffer from, endometriosis. It was like hell for me, like World War Three down there. So your uterus can be pulled one way, your ovaries can be sort of twisted. It creates, of course, as you can imagine, a significant amount of pain. One in 10 women are affected by it, but it still goes misdiagnosed or overlooked. Why? And how can you spot the signs? I'm Samantha Johnson, and this is Now You Know, a new series from Al Jazeera dedicated to amplifying women's voices, stories, and at times, some pretty uncomfortable topics. This is a safe space where we go all in. So by the end of each episode, you can say, now I know. Now, I've known Anita for a good few years, thanks to working in sports media. And she is, hands down, one of the most hilarious and down-to-earth women I know. But she's also one of the strongest women I know. And to this day, I still don't know how she's managed to hide her pain so well. But let's be honest, when it comes to us women, we just get on with it. We know how to go through that pain barrier. It's not always healthy, but we just get on with it. So Anita, I really appreciate you coming on now, you know, to share your endometriosis story. So again, thank you for for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, we're here to talk about your story. So I do want to start from the beginning because yours is a story of, I suppose, just being misunderstood and being misdiagnosed. So I believe it was the age of 14 where you went to the doctors to talk about you know, your painful menstrual cycle. So can you take us to that moment when you were talking to those doctors and what their response was? I think anyone who's listening or watching who has endometriosis or anyone who has someone in their family or close circles will probably think what I'm about to say is all too familiar. I would miss a lot of school actually at 14. I'd started my period at 12, but then it felt like from one day to the next, all of a sudden, they were just excruciatingly painful. No one can see it, but um, it was just debilitating. And like I had a, a teacher at school that was my saving grace. And so I'd gone to her one day and told her that I was having these really bad pains. And she said, if you're ever in a lesson, just excuse yourself to go to the toilet and then come join me in the gym where she'd be taking most of her classes. And that happened every month. And then... Um, Finally went home to my mum and said that, like, I can't p- concentrate. Mm. Like, it's impacting my ability to learn. And so she's like, let's go to the doctor. My mum had also had painful periods. So um, when you're confronted with that, that a parent has also had it, it's very easy to be told, oh, it could just be hereditary. You're just having painful periods and women get them all the time. Um, but the doctor then just said to me, some women get it or some girls get it that's it and from that moment on it was just the thing of me going back to the doctors and me being told like to my face this is normal I just then accepted that and looking back now there was an incident when I was like 15 and I was hospitalized for pain around my right pelvic bone they thought I had appendicitis since then I've learned that like appendicitis is is a common misdiagnosis for for women with endometriosis so um, it kind of links up because around that area is where I'd had the problem for most of my life. When did you realise what was happening to you wasn't normal? So I was about 27. Wow. I'd gone on the contraceptive pill at 18. The uh, symptoms 
weren't as bad. Mm. They were still very bad. Like I was taking things from like the age of 20, like codeine or opioids, like every month when I'd have a period, I'd get really bad migraines, regularly miss out on things with my friends. Like I'd look at my calendar and I'd predict when my period was more or less going to come if I wasn't on the pill and I'd know like that's probably going to be a down week for me. Don't overload yourself with things because you're going to have to cancel. Mm. So yeah, I didn't know until I was like 27. And what happened is the pain was not only when I was bleeding, it then extended outside of that. So like when you're on the pill, traditionally you're taking it for 21 days, then you have a seven day break. So for years, it had been that during that seven day break is when it was like hell for me, like World War Three mm-hmm. down there. But then all of a sudden it changed and I was having pains in the middle of the, the 21 days when I was on the pill and it was unexplained and it was in particular on my right, like pelvic side, but then it got even more intense and it was leading up to when I started my period. And then a few days after I finished. And then one day I remember being on Facebook at the time, cause it was what, like 2017 and a friend of a friend had like shared this post on, on Facebook saying that she'd just been diagnosed with this condition called endometriosis and she listed all of her symptoms and I literally identified with all bar one and it was like the pain down there, the, um, the, the ovulation pain, the stabbing, migraines um, and she mentioned that she'd felt gaslit every time she went to the doctors mm. that she'd been told repeatedly it was normal and so when I saw that alarm bells went in my head and I like went to the doctor the next day and asked to see a gynecologist but had I have not seen her post I would have continued to ignore the signs that my body had told me because if your body's in pain that's not normal like no one should think their body showing any level of pain is normal but the, specifically the pain mm. I was in um is not normal so tell me about your your support system as well I mean I know that you 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 document your story on TikTok, on Instagram. But when it comes to a closer circle, when it comes to your girlfriends, your family, I mean, what does that look like to you? What does your support network look like? Yeah, the support system, it, it's a tough one because you don't see it, right? Like my parents do see me, they've seen me over the years, be bound, like just about have enough energy to wake up, to go to work, come back. On the one hand, you don't want well, for me, I don't want my existence to be around this condition. Mm. Like, I don't want to just be known as that or that girl that's got endometriosis or she's always talking about her periods and stuff like that. But on the other, it takes up such a huge part of my life, especially now where I've had to have a second surgery and before that, froze my eggs because it looked like I'd need a second surgery. Um, are you comfortable talking about your surgeries? Can you, can yeah. you tell uh, us your journey with the first one? Again, I'm very mindful of saying the UK system, Mm -hmm. in particular the national health system. um, Once you're in the system to see a gynecologist, they will then send you to do scans, like ultra scans. And with a condition like endometriosis, um, it's very hard to detect on ultra scans unless it's on your ovaries. So many times it's not detected. And so I had several ultra scans and then I had transvaginal scans to see if they can see anything again nothing and I was asked do I want to continue with the investigations next investigation being a laparoscopy and I said 100% like I've been suffering for what nearly 14 years something's not right here and so then uh it's a laparoscopy they go through your belly button and in my first surgery they'd found endometriosis on my abdominal wall on the right side they'd found it um in a couple of other places too and it all like made sense afterwards like the right side being such a cause of pain for me that that's where a lot of it was concentrated and I remember like coming around from the the anesthetic and um talking to some someone I don't know if it was a nurse and I'm still quite hazy I'm not with it and I asked like what happened? Did they see anything? And he was just like, yeah, it looks like you had endometriosis. And I just like, again, under the influence of the anesthetic, I was just like, I knew it. I knew oh, it. Like, I was, I was, so how did you feel? Terrible. Like you've, you've been vindicated, basically. You, you had pain for a reason and you knew it. Yeah, it was mixed. I was like, 
I wasn't going mad on the one hand and on the other hand, really upset. And then, um, interestingly, when the surgeon came around to see me and my family afterwards, he spoke about the fact that they've gotten rid of it. And, um, there's two ways they can get rid of it. They can either try burn it or scrape it out. And in that first surgery, they, they burnt it away. But, um, he said, the thing is it can come back. Didn't really take that into consideration. I was just like, I've had my surgery and within a week I was walking fine. Like I always have to take things easy. And then within the first three months of like having the surgery, they normally recommend that you are on the contraceptive pill without a break. So not allowing the body to have a period so that it can minimize any potential regrowth. Mm. So your hormonal levels aren't allowed to reach the, the the regular levels and so I remember doing that for three months and I felt no different like I felt like I felt before the surgery and so went and saw a consultant and they said at this point I'd suggest that you get the coil fitted the the Mirena coil fitted which is a coil which has hormones and the idea is that because it's uh inserted close to the affected area the hormones are able to do their job better mm -hmm. than taking a pill where it passes through all of your body um, and it's longer to reach the affected area and so I was reluctant I didn't really want to get a coil the idea of it scared me like having something fitted up there I know some women have it fitted during surgery but that that was never an option mm -hmm. for me I wasn't even told about it but uh desperate and in pain I said okay I'll try it and that was like one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. For me, I, I would never have done it if I didn't have endometriosis. And so um, the pain then was terrible. Like the, the six months after it, I was virtually bleeding every day, still on opioids heavily, which is what I didn't want. But I was told by a nurse to try and stick with it for, for the six months. Six months came and all of a sudden the pain went like that. and I. Um, I didn't have a period for six months after that. It was the first time in my life where periods weren't ruling me, weren't ruling my life. I was just like, wow, is this how some women live or girls, you know, like they just go about their life and they don't think about uh, heavy flows or think about like having to always have medication or altering their, their social calendar or thinking about work a bit more um, depending on the, the, at the time of month. And so it was incredible. And then I remember during the lockdown, I went to work one day and I went to the toilet and I was just violently bleeding out of nowhere. And I didn't know why. You know, I was surprised and I said, okay, maybe it's just a one-off. And then this kept happening like for a few days in a row. And I then went to see a doctor because I was a bit concerned. I was having pains and I was just having this random heavy bleeding. And they, the first port of call was to check that the coil hadn't fit, moved, rather. It didn't move. And then I was back in the system seeing a specialist and they said everything indicated like the endometriosis was growing back. I tried pelvic floor therapy, something I don't think many women have heard of. Essentially, my muscles had cramped up so much from all the pain that my pelvic floor never relaxed. And so the idea of it was to try and get my muscles to relax so that hopefully the cramping that I had would be easier. Mm. Um, it didn't help. It was terrible. It was a whole, like, it was a terrible experience. I tried it. That didn't work. I removed the coil. That didn't help. And then uh, had another surgery. So I want to give you insight into what it's like living with endo. Today, I have my second surgery for it. To look at you. Anyone would think that you are just the picture of health. I mean, look, I I follow you on Instagram I, and on, on TikTok. I know you personally. And you just emit such light and positivity. And it shows in your work as well. Like you are 100% just on it all the time. And your job, I know what your job's like. It's very intense. You travel a lot. You have to be a people person. You have to prep. You have to be on it with your preparation uh, when it comes to, you know, live football games as well. You're doing live TV. 
week of intense scrutiny, Manchester United got a confidence-boosting win. Talking about the team, of course, big signing this summer, Kylian Mbappe, but you guys have already won without him. What You're interviewing top footballers. I mean, yeah, your, yeah. your interview with uh, Jude Bellingham, it went viral. I think you tested him on his Spanish. And finally, ¿cómo van las clases de español? Sí, sí. Uh, <laughs> dos cada semana. Oh, sí. okay, not bad, okay. Well, well not done. Not on your level yet, we're getting there. <laughs> like, you are front and centre. Like, there's no hiding when you are in front of the camera and you are broadcasting towards millions. So what you do, it's not just a normal job. It's, you have to find that extra energy to put on a performance. So how do you do that? It might sound a bit unhealthy, but part of my approach of endometriosis has been like, I don't want to lose to it, which is silly. And I'm like, I say that and I never want it to sound like I'm saying women who maybe can't go to work are losing to it. That's not, that's not my intention at all. But like, I feel like it's robbed me of a lot already and it's caused me a lot of pain. And so when I'm in a working environment, I don't want to lose that either. I don't, I don't want to be in a position where I'm having to say to someone, I can't do this because of it. And so I think that's what probably pushes me. But then I push myself too much and then I'm really tired. But it's this element of not wanting to be weak which is sad and that's, that's something to do with me it's nothing to do with women being weak if they can't do things um but it's a, probably the reason why I will go to work do work and then afterwards I'm at home in bed I have such supportive work environments I've never felt like if I were to miss work because of it my job would be in jeopardy mm. like that that's I'm very fortunate but there's still something in me that doesn't want to feel like I and losing to the illness. What do you wish someone could have told you when you were younger about how to deal with the pain of endometriosis? Listen to your body. You know best. Listen to your body. And again, that's not to discredit medical professionals, but if you are in pain repeatedly and it is debilitating, that is your body giving you a clear sign that something isn't right. And to not listen to it is more dangerous in the long run. Like when you see the devastating effects that a condition like endometriosis can have. If you're armed with the information and you know your, your pain threshold, you are able to advocate for yourself more and make informed decisions. Anita Jones. I wish I could give you a big hug, the biggest hug. Um, look at that smile. Look at look at that smile. This is what this is. This is the Anita we know. You are you're one of the strongest women I know. And um, thank you for coming on to now you know and sharing your journey. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. It's been brilliant talking to you. Thank you for um, creating a safe space. So where do we stand in the fight against this condition? With so many people affected by this condition, I wanted to speak to someone who could tell us why women, especially women of colour, still find it so hard to get a proper endometriosis diagnosis. But not only that, once the diagnosis is made, why getting effective treatment is still so difficult. So we tracked down Jandra Mueller. She's a pelvic floor physical therapist, and much of her work focuses on chronic pelvic pain, one of the surest signs that a woman has endometriosis. So Jandra, uh, thank you so much for joining us on Now You Know. We've got a lot to get through. Thank you for having me. Very excited. Okay, so many of us know about the condition endometriosis. We may even know someone that has this condition, but there seems to be a bit of mystery around it. So can you just Tell us what endometriosis really is and can you break it down? Sure. So at the basic level, endometriosis is cells that are similar to the lining of the uterus, the endometrium, but they are not exactly the same. So they behave similarly, they look similarly, but they are found throughout the body, most commonly in the ab abdominal pelvic area, so around our our organs in our belly and our pelvic organs, reproductive organs. So that's outside of the uterus. And it attaches and it can look very different. It 
can cause a significant amount of pain amongst a number of other symptoms and infertility. But painful periods and infertility essentially is what endometriosis is kind of known for, although there's so much more to it. And so these lesions implant and can create inflammation. They can create pain. They can cause a a structural change in the organs, a twisting, a pulling that really can't be seen for the most part in imaging. So it's kind of a silent disease. So stretching. So you're, 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 so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting up like I'm going to just stretch my organs now, but it's doing that by itself. This is what this condition does. Yeah. Complete. It can be complete distortion of the abdominal pelvic organ. So your uterus can be pulled one way, your ovaries can be sort of twisted, things can be adhered to the walls of your abdomen, so the colon, things can be stuck together. And so it creates, of course, as you can imagine, a significant amount of pain and discomfort that is not regularly seen. It can be, but most people aren't quite there yet and being able to see that until they go into surgery. Okay, so you've just kind of blown our minds with that information. But it would seem that awareness about endometriosis isn't just the problem, it's the actual diagnosis. Now, we spoke to Anita's um, Anita's journey, and she she was just telling us that when she went to the doctor, the doctor was saying, oh, you know, this is normal. This is what women go through. And she went back thinking, you know, this isn't normal. So when it comes to diagnosis, I mean, what's the disconnect? I mean, from going to the doctor saying, I have this incredible, excruciating pain to, oh, you know what? This is just what women go through. This is normal. There's got to be something wrong here. Absolutely. And unfortunately, that's the more common scenario. The outlier is that person who goes in to see somebody who actually knows about this disease and starts treatment right away. And so part of that starts with our knowledge or lack thereof of the disease and how it presents. For example, in the United States, ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, so the governing body of an OBGYN, and their recommendations state, you know, most adolescents have what's called primary dysmenorrhea. So dysmenorrhea just means painful periods, essentially. And when you start your period, they and you have pain, you go to the doctor and it's primary, meaning there's no known pathology. However, they don't actually advise to do any sort of workup or imaging surgery until it persists. So it's kind of this roundabout way until somebody's like really complaining of pain, but even still, they don't necessarily get that diagnosis. And so primary dysmenorrhea, let's try some anti-inflammatory medications like Advil, naproxen, Motrin, and or let's put you on birth control pills because, of course, birth control pills are the solution to everything. Just shut down the period and it's fine. And part of that is because endometriosis is It's not the endometrium. It's cells that are similar to that. But historically, we've taken some of the early thought process and the information that was gained in the 1920s or even before, and we've kind of made this disease about the uterus. So if we shut that down, we take care of the endometrium, no more problems. And so if somebody then responds well to, let's say, Advil or birth control pills, which many do, many do not, then they say, yep, it's primary dysmenorrhea and this is the solution. But it still progresses. The, these things, these medications do not stop the disease from progressing. And some people still have significant symptoms through it. On the other hand, people with endometriosis do respond to those in a way. But what happens when they come off of it? And so it's a really tricky way to, to try to determine who has this disease and who doesn't. There was a Congress that came together, a World Congress, and many different societies, representatives came together to look at guidelines and say, you know, what should, what's the level of evidence that we can say an adolescent has endometriosis and what should be the plan and a number of other things. And it's interesting because ACOG was not in attendance or nobody representing ACOG was in attendance there. And they actually say, you know, it's interesting because when you start to talk to women 
or people who have been diagnosed with endometriosis, they date their symptoms starting back to their adolescence. And so we need to really be listening to these women. But if they're going to the doctors and those doctors are taught it's primary, just put them on birth control or anti-inflammatory medications and you'll be fine. This is what's in part playing into this huge delay of diagnosis. When it comes to women of color, things are even worse. So how exactly does structural racism affect the rate of diagnosis and access to treatment and care for women of color? It's still it's still more difficult for women of color to get an accurate diagnosis and accurate in good pain management and somebody to believe them. And endo does not really affect any, you know, culture, race, any differently than any other. And so we have thought, though, women of color, oh, they are less impacted by endo, less impacted by conditions that involve pain and inflammation where that's not necessarily true. And maybe it's more, maybe it's not, but they're definitely not being listened to. Going back to some of the guidelines, even this year, there's ACOG has a an online continuing education module for physicians to learn about this disease, and they still have in there endometriosis does not seem to impact women of color with a little asterisk. This may or may not be the case, and and we know that that what, is not the, the case. Though? It's it's I'm sorry. This is this is playing with my mind here, as I'm sure it does for you. But it just doesn't make sense. Like okay, it it doesn't affect women of color. It affects women. Period. But correct. It's worse for women of color. Well, yeah, they actually state it's less. It, it, it impacts women of color less. And that's just not that's just not true. But that is still 2024. That is in ACOG, the governing body of the United States. It is in their lecture. Just because a woman gets a fine um, gets a final diagnosis, it doesn't mean that the pain goes away or the problem goes away. Why is this? Yeah. So part one, getting a diagnosis or getting somebody to believe you for that diagnosis. Second part is the treatment for that, right? And so let now you got a diagnosis or you found a doctor that says, yeah, I think you have this. You've tried all these things. Okay, next step is let's go in and see surgery. So it used to be, at least in my experience working with patients and myself, that If you went to a doctor and they said, I'm going to excise the lesion, so endometriosis excision, you kind of knew that that was your person and they were going to do it the right way. They were going to do it fully or ablation, which is burning the tip of the lesion. So it's not removing the lesion. It's actually taking kind of a laser and heating it to burn the tip of it, like the tip of the iceberg. But the thing is, is that you don't know how deep the lesion is until you start to remove it. Again, just like cancer, you want to clear the margins. So it used to be that you went and the doctor said, I do excision. You got the whole thing. Ablation, you might go through treatment. You might not. But you know that that's probably nowadays most people know like we don't. That's not what you want to do. So now it's most people are actually doing excision, at least that I've seen. There's there's a trend in this, but it doesn't mean that they're visualizing all of the lesions or recognizing all of the less common lesions. And I see that in my practice all the time. And that's actually what happened to me as well. I knew a little bit more going into it that this was going to be sort of a trial, but it's exactly what happened to me. I tend to grow more fibrotic type tissue, which some and the research may say that this is end-stage disease. It might not be the case, but that was not recognized as endo because you're learning, maybe the doctors are learning a couple different uh, presentations of the disease when they go in. And so that's become more of a problem now. And so this persistence of endo, or then you say, I got the surgery, maybe it wasn't the correct one, maybe it wasn't fully, and I'm still in pain, I'm still not better okay, now we've moved into this pain science world, which is great to have, but it's a tool like anything else. And I think then these patients that actually still have endometriosis left are now being kind of categorized as centralized pain or central sensitization when really they may actually be having persistent endo. Well, for our viewers and our listeners to anyone who thinks that they might have endometriosis, what are the symptoms 
they should be looking out for? So, of course, the most common are going to be painful periods. And yes, can you have a little bit of cramps here and there? Sure. First day, it should not be interfering with your life. And it should be it, it should be tolerable, meaning like, can you take an Advil the first day and it goes away and you can live your life and fine? Sure. Again, there's people like myself who never had painful periods. So are you having pain at different parts of your cycle that make you want to go to the ER, make you avoid school, work, social events? That is not normal. So listen to your body. Listen to yourself. Ask questions with your family about your family. You know, did anyone, females, have a hysterectomy for any reason? You may find that your mom or grandma or your dad's mom had a hysterectomy or your aunts or your cousins, and all of a sudden there's three or four that did, but they don't know why. Oh, it was Mm. for XYZ, probably misdiagnosed, or fibroids. Fibroids are going to be, they're often linked to with endometriosis, not to say that everyone with fibroids has endo, but you you do often see them hand in hand. And so ask those questions and you might start to gain like, oh, I do have a family history and that's not normal. And so that's the main thing. Infertility, if you've been trying and you, nothing, quote unquote, has been found to be wrong, meaning, you know, you've, you have clear tubes, you have all this. It's probably endometriosis. I think up to 50% of unknown fertility issues are due to endometriosis. And it may not be worth spending all the money at first to go through IVF or IUI or egg retrievals. You may want to talk with somebody who specializes in endometriosis before you do that because you're going to be more successful. Aside from that, if there is, you know, for me, it was a lot of GI symptoms. Urinary symptoms are very prominent. So frequency, urgency, interstitial cystitis could be, that's another topic, but that could be a presentation of endometriosis. Um, Severe rectal pain when you have an urge to go to the bathroom or when you're going to the bathroom, that can be endometriosis in the backside of the uterus by where the rectum is. Mm. And you don't have to have all of them. You can have one. You can have two. You can have all of them. Um, but kind of taking that history and looking at those symptoms is is important, especially when doctors can't find what's wrong with you. Jandra Mueller, thank you very much for joining us on Now You Know. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. So now you know about endometriosis the emotional and physical toll it takes on millions of women worldwide and what's been done to make sure this condition is taken seriously. Thank you to Anita Jones for sharing her continued emotional journey and to Jandra Mueller for her insight. And of course, a special thanks to you for watching and listening to Now You Know. 